Hang on, guys. So I think um, there was a volume problem. Drina, can you hear now? Let me make sure that we've got things that are good. Drina, can you hear on my, uh, can you hear now? Okay. Uh, so in Revelation chapter 8, 1, when the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence throughout heaven for about half an hour. And then we have the reference of Zechariah 2, 13, where it says, Be silent all flesh before the Lord, for he is aroused out of his holy habitation. So if you are just tuning in, we've got all of these episodes on our Destination Church podcast, as well as our YouTube channel, etc. You can get caught up. Um, but as we learned in chapter 6, the opening of the seals was for the unsaved, the end of the, the world. It was the, the wrath is coming from God. But we're going to see that the context for the trumpets, it's actually not his wrath. There's still an opportunity for um, restoration, for repentance. In fact, this is the restoration of all things, and that includes taking back Israel and it becoming the returning king's base of operations for ruling uh, the, the nations. And we also see that with this silence in heaven, which is just an unprecedented situation because the angels, the living creatures, they can't stay silent because of the majesty of God that is on display. When he blinks, when he turns his head, when he moves, it just evokes this praise uh, from these creatures. And so the fact that there's silence, uh, to me, it speaks of the solemn, holy situation going on, but it also is the anticipation of what is about to happen. And that is, again, the restoration of all things. So I want to give you the scriptures for that. That is Acts 3, 19 through 21. It says, Now repent of your sins and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord, and he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah, for he must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. So the book of Revelation is a the, the prophetic picture of the restoration of all things and the apocalypto, the removing the cover of Jesus Christ. That's, it's a, it said it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. So because of his uh, approaching return, the enemy ramps up his attempts to resist him. The world begins to convulse in rebellion of sin because creation cries out for the revealing of the sons of God. So all of these things are culminating. Uh, maturity for both those that know him and those that don't is beginning to um, show itself. And, and so the end of the age is the harvest. And so there's all these things that are both good and bad running almost parallel to one another during this time. The word times in Acts 3, 19 through 21 is kairos. It's a period of opportunity in a certain season. And here the reference is refreshing that is specific to the presence of the Lord. And when we get to the end of this, I think you're going to really like the connection there. It is a state, uh, refreshment, is a state of cheer and encouragement after a period of having been troubled and upset. So that's what the presence of the Lord does. And that's why it's so crucial to practice the presence of the Lord now so that as the end of the age approaches, we can continue that practice and we can have that refreshing that will only come from Him and his presence, and we can remain in a state of cheer and encouragement, although we will be surrounded by death, which I did teach about that in one of the previous lessons. For some reason, this is crooked, and it's starting to bother me just a little bit. Okay, uh, so we have to cultivate presence, and this is what I, our life should look like. It should be refreshing for ourselves and for those that we come into contact with. Those that have sided with the Antichrist, however, 
their life as they know it is coming to an end. And that's why um, they're concerned because they traded their soul for wealth, power, and security, and now they're going to lose everything. So the opening of the seventh seal, you have 30 minutes of silence. That then kicks off the trumpets. But before we get into that, this is we've got to understand our role at the end of the age and why prayer is so important. So in verse 2, it says, I saw the seven angels who stand before God. They were given seven trumpets. Then another angel with the gold incense burner came and stood at the altar. And a great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and threw it down upon the earth and thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and there was a terrible earthquake. So once again, like we saw in verses or chapters four and five, our prayers mixed with the incense in heaven is what actually kicks off the events. So our prayers are kicking off the seven trumpets, okay? In Luke 18, 6 through 9, I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation as well as the Amplified. It says, Then the Lord said, Learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think that God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns... How many will he find on the earth who have faith? Now listen to verse 7 and 8 in the Amplified. And will not our just God, because he's not unjust like the other that had to be pressured and pestered, but our just God defend and protect and avenge his elect, his chosen ones, who cry to him day and night, will he defer them and delay help on their behalf? I tell you, he will defend and protect and avenge them speedily. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find persistence in faith on the earth? So the first thing is the context of 24-7 prayer, okay? So the 24-7 prayer across the earth is a sign of the end of the age. So a massive prayer movement, movement, which we've seen and is still continuing to this day, is going to build and swell across the earth at this, as, uh, from the saints of God. What is troubling to me is Jesus asked the question, will he find persistence and faith on the earth? I, I personally get a little nervous when God in the flesh is wondering if he's going to find faith, faith on the earth when he returns. I don't know about you, but that's a little bit nerve wracking. So to me, it shows again how important it is to understand the end of the age how important it is to have the refreshing from his presence and how important it is to maintain faith in spite of what we might see coming down, okay? So we have this 27, uh, 24-7 prayers for justice. A great example of this was uh, the Israelites when they were enslaved and their cries came before the Father and he then sent their Savior, Moses, to deliver them uh, in the Exodus. And then also we see it repeatedly happen in the book of Judges. Um, now, in the book of Judges, a lot of the reason they needed rescue was because of idolatry. But the story of Exodus is actually a great, great example and prophetic picture of the end of the age and our Exodus into our um, heavenly bodies. Now, I want to um, real quick go over into Matthew 25 and 26. Uh, to give you a little uh, tidbit there to help you. In verses 1 through 13, it says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. So notice, all of them slept, but of the five or of the ten, five had extra oil. At midnight, they were aroused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming, come out and meet him. 
All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked others, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. And they said, well, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to the shop and get some for yourselves. While they were gone to buy oil, and remember, oil represents presence, the anointing, the Holy Spirit, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. What made them ready? The extra oil. Presence is key. Later, when the other five returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, open the door for us. But he said, believe me, I don't know you. So you two must keep watch. That's a very important word. For you do not know the day or hour of my return. So a lack of presence, a lack of oil disqualified them. Okay. Now, Jesus, take that word watch and take Jesus's example of the night that he was arrested in Matthew 26, 40 through 41. So he goes into intense prayer, so intense that uh, he was sweating blood. And it says, he returned to the disciples. He found them asleep. He said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you do not give in to temptation for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. So you can imagine there was just this intense, depressive atmosphere and heaviness that caused them to be drowsy and to just want to sleep. And so the Lord was telling them, what you need to do is keep watch and pray so that you do not give in to temptation. This is a, a message for us as the end of the age people. The word um, watch in, uh, in the Greek means to remain awake because of the need to continue alert. Because, now this is all from the definition, quote, if the man of the house knew the time when the thief would come, he would stay awake. So the darkest and the, the coldest part of night is right before the dawn. And the same is going to be true for the end of the age. At the midnight hour, at the last hour. Now I know midnight and dawn are two different things. But the idea is that things are going to be so dark um, that we have to maintain that attitude of watchfulness and prayerfulness. The attitude of presence and oil in order to not give in to temptation. Okay, that's going to be very, very key. So we have to learn to see and discern with the eyes of our spirit man versus our natural eyes or we'll get tripped up. Okay, so his return. Here's where things can get tricky. Some believe that the trumpets are the wrath of God. I do not believe that. Um, I do want to give you the many purposes, biblical purposes of trumpets. One, a sound for holy convocation or gathering. Two, an announcement of God's arrival. Three, use a connection with praise and offerings. Four, blown at special occasions and special seasons. Five, prophetic warning of God's judgment that if ignored was costly. Six, use in battle. And seven, at royal coronations. So we do see <clears throat> that trumpets are for the announcement of the king and his return and his coronation, etc., a gathering. Uh, and then we also know uh, in Matthew 24, uh, 29 through 31, that after the sun and moon were darkened and the stars fell, a sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens and he will send his angels with the mighty blast of a trumpet to gather his people. So we know that at some point in the trumpets, we are going to be caught up to meet him in the air. Paul tells us the exact trumpet, okay? So in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, it says, It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. So it's going to be number seven. And you'll find as we continue, that is exactly correct. And I will show you where we're caught up uh, in the book of Revelation. So when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And those who are living will be transformed. So the last trumpet is when we are transformed or we are resurrected if we have already gone to sleep. Also, the fact that we have people p p praying 24-7 for justice in the earth tells us there are believers on the earth, especially during the first six trumpets. Okay, Now, back to Egypt and the Israelites. During the ten plagues, note 
the Lord did not deliver them in a rapture during the 10 plagues. They came out after the 10th. However, they dwelt in a place called Goshen. Goshen means drawing near. Isn't that cool? Okay, so our Goshen is us drawing near to him in presence. It's the time of refreshing that Acts 3 is referring to. So plain and simple, Goshen is, Goshen is the place of drawing near to God to be as close to him as possible. My prayer every day is, Father, help me to know Holy Spirit as much as humanly possible on this earth. Okay, I probably should say super humanly possible. So Goshen is presence. Goshen is that extra oil. Goshen is the times of refreshing. Okay. All right. So let's just kind of read what the trumpets are and then we'll finish up. So the first angel blew his trumpet. Hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down to the earth. One uh, third of the earth was on fire. One third of the trees were burned and all the grass, green grass was burned. The second angel blew his trumpet. A great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. One third of the water in the sea became blood. One third of all things living in the sea died. And one third of all the ships of the sea were destroyed. Then the third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from the sky. Burning like a torch, it fell on one third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star was bitterness. It made one third of the water bitter and many people died from drinking the bitter water. I am of the mind that that might be a nuclear event. Um, but I'm not sure. The fourth angel blew his trumpet. One third of the sun was struck. One third of the moon. One third of the stars. They became dark. One third of the day was dark and one third of the night. Notice the thirds. Then I looked and I heard a single eagle crying loudly as it flew through the air. Terror, terror, terror to all be who belong to this world because of what will happen when the next three angels, the last three angels, blow their trumpets. So the first four trumpets are an opportunity for the inhabitants of the earth to repent. They affect the natural wor world, the earth, water, and skies. So meter strikes, nuclear strikes, etc. We don't know for sure, but things have gone crazy. Then after the first four, we've got this eagle or vulture is actually the original language, crying terror to those who belong to this world. That's not referring to God's people. It's not referring to being an inhabitant of the earth. It's referring to those that are disloyal, that do not know God, and that have um, taken the mark. Okay? Um, now, the word terror means a state of intense hardship or distress, disaster, and horror. It's the idea of how greatly one will suffer or what terrible pain will come to one. So things are bad, but they're about to get real bad. And that's for those who dwell in the world, okay? So for us, our habitation is to be Goshen, uh, and that will protect us from the things that are coming to the inhabitants of the world. All right, got it done in time for coffee. So um, I don't know why my microphone's not working. So, you know, got the first part of it that's silent. Hopefully people will keep watching. But you guys have a great night. And my plan is to do urgent education this week. I'm not going to say when because it never happens the day I want. But expect to see me one more time live.